cut in two minutes. Okay. So, what about questions? I mean, uh, if you prefer, you could ask. I prefer if it's in the middle. In the middle, yeah. yeah so, yeah, because then it's more informal. Okay. It's, it's better to, to get the response. Okay, so just say that. Yeah. But still, I mean, I will try to be yeah. in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because the next one will start at 3.20. Okay, okay. I'll go in my desk if you can do it. So let's begin. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Emily Shida. Uh, Emily is a researcher of uh, Physics Institute in Clermont-Ferrand. It's France. Yeah, Institute of Physics of Clermont-Ferrand. Yes, so in France. And uh, so I will let you introduce your lectures. Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, forgot to tell you that there will be two lectures, one today, the next one will be tomorrow. And the next one will not be in the conference room, it will be in the room number 48. Two lectures. First part today, the next part tomorrow. Завтра не в конференц-зале, завтра лекция пройдет в 48 аудитории. Все, значит, приступаем к докладу. So you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for having me here. Thank you, Masha, for, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today or tomorrow about uh, machine learning and its applications to astronomy. Uh, so this, this set of lectures are divided in two parts. So today it's going to be a more introduc introductory material. So if you are already uh, used to machine learning, you're probably going to revise things that you already know. And then tomorrow I will go through more uh, uh, state-of-the-art applications of deep learning and active learning and the applications to astronomy. So I would just um, uh, I would just want to let to ask you that if you have any questions, please stop me in the middle of the presentation. Okay, it's better that way because then we are you're sure that up to that point everything is clear to everybody, right? Um, so uh, uh, just so I before I start, uh, just so I can have an idea, how many of you use machine learning in your daily life in your research? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, as I said, I will try to uh, keep this in time, and, but if you have any questions at any point, just stop me and then we, we continue on that way, okay? This is supposed to be very, uh, uh, very informal, so uh, we can all understand each other. Um, so before, uh, I will I would like to introduce myself because it's the first time uh, that I'm in Russia, actually. Um, I'm a researcher, as Masha sa Maria said, in the uh, Laboratoire de Physique de Clermont, but I'm originally Brazilian. Uh, I'm in France, but I'm originally Brazilian. Um, I work mainly on Type 1A supernova, machine learning, and Bayesian statistics, and also a large part of my work uh, is uh, developing different interdisciplinary science environments. So I work uh, with, within the Cosmos Statistics Initiative, thinking about how can we boost our uh, research results if we can better interact with people from different backgrounds that have different knowledge but can complement what we do. So if uh, any of you are ever uh, uh, want to uh, talk about it, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. Uh, and every time I go to a new place, uh, I think I also have to clarify where is Clément Ferrand. So this is the first thing you will learn today. Clermont Ferrand is here. It's like three hours, 300 kilometers more or less south of Paris. Um, it is in the middle, uh, literally in the middle of France, right? So these green things around Clermont here is our chain of volcanoes. So the city is very known for people who like hiking and doing mountain stuff. There's a lot of volcanoes around. Uh, if you talk to people in the geological department, they will tell you that they are dormant. They are not extinct. 
but that's another story. Um, uh, the city is the birthplace of Blaise Pascal. Um, they are very, very proud of their cheese tradition, which I'm not French, so I cannot say to that, but they are. Um, and uh, this is the Puy de Dome, which is the most fam famous volcano that we have around. Um, and also, but instead, uh, uh, beyond all of those things, we also have in the Université clermont a, a very active group working on astronomy and specifically on Type 1A supernova in the LSST and Supernova Factory uh, and the ZTF. So uh, if you ever are any, by any chance near this part of France, you are all welcome to stop by and say hello. So this is the summary for what I'm going to talk today. So first, we are going to introduce what exactly we mean when we talk about machine learning. Uh, the second, we are going to define supervised and unsupervised learning and define what is a learning algorithm and a learning model. So by the end of today, I hope that you all will have a good idea of what is important and uh, what are the hypotheses behind the model and a few of the algorithms we are also going to go through. And then tomorrow we go to the more um, uh, thing stuff. I tried in all of my slides to put uh, references in the bottom for whatever thing I got. But if, I for, if in any case I forgot, I have to say that I stole things here by a bunch of other people that, uh, that have already produced materials in this. So just this, the acknowledgement of everyone that I stole things. I have a couple of disclaimers to make before I start. So we can all start with the same level here. First, you should be very, very aware and suspicious of black boxes, okay? So we are going to, uh, sometimes during my presentation, I'm going to use a box as a description of what's happening, but that should not be black in any way. You should understand what is going on. And one thing that we should also keep in mind, uh, especially nowadays when you see in the media that there's a lot of deep learning going on, a, a, different, a different artificial intelligence algorithm going on, and there's a lot of uh, journal articles saying that, uh, um, uh, magazine articles saying that we have to understand why this works or things like that. So I just want you to keep in mind that a neural network or any machine learning is not an, uh, a natural, uh, uh, it's not a natural occurrence of nature, right? A uh, machine learning algorithm is an algorithm. Someone wrote that, and if someone wrote that, we can probably go inside and understand what's going on. So uh, all of the questions of interpretability of machine learning becomes uh, a little less troubling, let's say, uh, if, we, if we are very, very suspicious of all black boxes that we find. And the second thing is, I will try my best to do not put any jargon in this lecture. Tomorrow will be impossible, you'll have to use some jargon, but if I say anything that you do not understand, please uh, just raise your hand and let me know because uh, this is, today it is important that whatever we say, even if you make questions, if you're someone who are used to machine learning and you wanna talk about uh, nearest neighbor algorithm, instead of saying nearest neighbor, you tell me, well, if I take the guy that is closest to that other one, because that helps everybody understand what's going on. Okay, so uh, this should be a conversation, okay? So I hope you guys uh, have a little a bit of willing to interact with me on this. My question, we we'll start with what is learning? For people or living humans, or living beings or whatever, uh, how you would describe what it is to learn? Do I have suggestions? You need to gain something new. Huh? You need to gain something new. To investigate something new, to acquire knowledge, right? Um, anything else? Show some examples. Show some examples. Yeah, you can you can look at an example and understand what's going on. Re yeah. repeat, repeat something that uh, is done by someone else. Yes. You do it for the first time, but you repeat after somebody. Exactly. So you acquire that knowledge you learn. So uh, you see that when we define learning for humans. We, all, we always define learning about one, in one way or the other, or we are learning for an example, or we are investigating something, or we are reproducing, but we are always, we are always talking about knowledge, right? When we, uh, when we define this for humans, uh, it, it, it only means what is inside our head. The, the, uh, the definition, uh, psychological definition of learning means something much, much more uh, deep than that. It says it's a relatively permanent, well, they're social people, so relatively permanent is something. 
uh, a relatively permanent change in behavior due to past experiences. So it doesn't matter if you, if you understand, if you acquire that knowledge, if that fact did not change anything in your behavior. Uh, so we are going to you, uh, and the machine learning description is much, it's based on this specific description uh, of learning. Uh, it's all obviously because we as humans, we have caveats, right? I know something, but I, I might have a thousand reasons that tells me that my actions should not change because of that, that new knowledge that I acquire. But that is an other level of complexity. The, in the most basic level of complexity, uh, learning means that you acquire a knowledge that will change your behavior after that. And, uh, and also for humans, when you think about humans, you think of learning as the power to adapt, right? So I have a situation, I adapt that situation to whatever knowledge I have, and uh, this allows me to improvise and succeed in even in new situations that I have never seen before. Now, based on that argument, what is machine learning? So, one of the most there is not a standalone definition for this, uh, but the most uh, a known uh, definition of machine learning is that machine learning is a field of computer science that gives computer the ability to learn with data without being explicitly programmed. This does not mean that you will not have a program, you will have a code, obviously. But the point is, the code will, the, the task of the code is to make a decision. And that decision will change depending on the data you input. And you are not going to change the code in order to change the output. You are going to change the input and this will naturally change the output. This is what it means by explicit programming. Um, yeah, so this is just to highlight what this actually means. Um, and I really like the Wikipedia definition of machine learning because I think it's very human. Uh, someone went there and made sure to put some quotes in learn. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the ability to learn because it's, it's a machine. Uh, it's progress, which means progressively improve a performance on a given task. So you see that machine learning will not learn whatever. It will learn a very specific thing for which it was built to. And this is probably the, the main difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, in many definitions. So artificial intelligence is when you try to build a system that like mimic what a living being would do. Uh, and machine learning, no. machine learning, you have a very specific task and you want to optimize for that task and that's it, right? You're not trying to mimic anything living here. Uh, so just let's get a little bit more technical on this. A computer program L is said to learn from experience E with respect to some task and performance if its performance in the task as measured by P improves with experience. So what we have to understand here is I have elements of a machine learning model. I have experience, which would be my data. I have the task, which would be the falsification, the regression, whatever thing I want to do. And I have a performance measurement, something that tells me if that thing, if my model is good enough or not, right? So these are going to be the, the elements of my thing. And then we can start talking about uh, different uh, categories of machine learning. Um, so in supervised learning, you can understand supervised learning as learning by example, right? So in supervised learning, I will always have a training set for which I have the features and the labels. So suppose that I, suppose that you want to estimate, I don't know, the house prices in a given area and you have a list of the size of the house and the price of that area. So you are going to learn whatever you can, and then you are going to apply that model in something where you only have the size of the house, for example, and then you want to estimate the price, right? So uh, in supervised learning, you will always have a training set. You will always need a small sample, or, a, or well, if it's big, it's better, but you always need a sample for which you have the observables that you have and the labels that you are trying to, to estimate. And your model will learn everything it has to learn from here, and then you can apply in another, in another set where you do not have labels. Is that clear? Yes. Um, so another way to look at this is that in supervised learning, what you are looking for is the boundary. So in a classification problem, for example, if I suppose that these two are two different, I don't know, maybe size and color uh, of, of these uh, uh, objects, 
if I if I if I have a training set, so I know that these guys are balls, and I know that that, that those guys are crosses. What I'm looking for in supervised learning is that boundary, in such a way that if I come with a new point that will stay here, I can say, ah, okay, this guy is an X because I don't know what I, I don't know what it is. But once I put it in this plot, I will say, okay, if it fits here is an X, if it fits here is ball, okay. Uh, and the other category of machine learning is unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, you have no labels. So there is no classes, let's say. What you are looking for in unsupervised learning is to look for structures in your data, right? So uh, if you have your, uh, your features here, what you are, you are saying is, okay, I do not know what, what each one of these guys are, but I know that these are similar to each other and they are different from the other guys who are similar between th themselves. So in supervised learning, what you are trying to do is to give some structure information and let the data itself uh, uh, tells you something about uh, the, the underlying structure of the data, okay? Uh, so just for summarizing, in supervised learning, we, are, we, we have this kind of situation where we look for the boundary, you have the features and the labels for the training sample, and for the target sample, you have only your features. And for unsupervised learning, you have only your features and you are looking for uh, structure, clusters, uh, groups uh, in, in your data, right? Or outliers, for example. Uh, okay, so let's begin with supervised learning. This is a classical like, example. Uh, uh, do you, someone knows the IRIS data set? Uh, so uh, the Argus data set is a very famous data set and uh, uh, researching for this lecture I, I, I learned that it was actually beginning to put together by Fisher, the guy from the Fisher matrix in 1936, I, don't, I didn't know that. Uh, but the, the Iris data set is a very famous data set that is available online, it's very easy to get, it's in scikit-learn and things like that. And um, it, it gives you, it has three types of flowers, right? And uh, it has four measurements for each type of flower. So it has this, the, okay, sepal, and this is important because I didn't need this. So the petal is the colored things, right, that we know from, from, the, from the, the, the flowers. The sepal is this green thing that put the flower together, right? Uh, this is just to, to, to a more definition. So uh, the, the data that you have in this data set is the sepal length, so it's this length, the sepal width, the, the width of this thing, and the petal length and the petal width. So you see you have three types of, uh, of classes of flowers in this data set, and you can plot uh, any, uh, any two by two uh, features of this data set and you will get something like this. You have 50 examples, 50 samples for each class in this data set. Uh, so in this, in this particular case, given uh, the elements that we talked about, what we have, the experience will be the data, right? So it would be our, 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 our data set. The task is the problem. In that case, it's a classification problem because the question that I can answer, that I can ask here is, uh, which, which flower belong to each class? I may want to build a classifier from this. And, um, the performance can be uh, a metric, something that tells me that uh, my model is correct or not. And uh, the algorithm would be how do I choose this? So suppose that I come here and uh, I put a line in each one of these, of these, of these uh, plots here. Um, so my question is, if I just put a line here and leave it like that, does this algorithm learn? given the definition we had before. If my, if my algorithm is only like this, I have this data and I draw lines and I say, okay, from here you are red and if you are up there, you might be uh, uh, green or blue. Yeah, this, it's not, it's not yes, exactly. It's not learning because it's a static decision, right? If I put more data in this, in here, it will not learn. Now, if I have an algorithm that look at the data and draw boundaries based on the data, and these boundaries might change if I add new data, then this algorithm will be, will be learning, given the definition that we talked about before. Okay? But did you say that the supervised learning is that the application of the line, so you yourself visualize 
So this is the super light, so, so this light will be the supervised This is supervised learning, yeah. So this is the learning. This is, uh, uh, so the fact that it is, it is a supervised learning only because I have a training set. So here I have a data set for which I know the colors and I will use the information to draw the line. It doesn't matter how I draw the line, this will be a supervised, supervised case. If I draw a line here and this line is static, doesn't change with whatever, this does not learn because if I put new data with colors, it will not update. But if I have an algorithm that tells me, okay, I come here and I use the colors to draw a boundary around each one of these classes, and if I put more data, uh, these boundaries will change, then the algorithm will be learning. Because I do not need to change the code, I just change the input data and the output will change. Okay? Um, so, the other, so this is a classification example. Um, uh, a regression example that you might have, this is another very famous as well, uh, available online everywhere, which is the house prices in the Boston area is very, uh, like 1978, so probably not, not representative. Um, but the point is, you have the average number of rooms per house and uh, the price of the house here. So when you look at that, uh, what you think is, okay, this seems like a straight line. Right? So I can have um, my, in this case, my data would be my experience. My task would be a regression, because my problem is a regression in this case. Um, the performance metric can be something very similar to what I, when I do a linear regression, right? It can be something like that. Uh, and uh, and, and the, the, the program would be a linear relation. The, the, the algorithm can be, okay, let's Let's draw, let's do the best linear regression we can within that data. Does this learn? Yes. Yes, why? Because it's the result of the line of the line by which the data is dependent on the data. Exactly. If I put more data here, the value that I find for A and B, and as a consequence, the estimation that I have. From my uh, from my line will change. So this method, although it's a very limited learning, right? Because it's it will only gonna learn uh, the, the, the 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 linear regression, but it will learn. So all of these examples that we did, you see that we had the data, we had the training data because we had labels for this data, and we learned something from this set of data that we have training. In this case, the the the, the number of rooms uh, is the features and the labels would be the house prices and in this other case uh, the, the features are these four and uh, the, the labels are the classes uh, for, the, for, for the flowers. Um, so you see that what you are doing, you have a data set uh, and then you are saying, okay, I am able to make some kind of decision based on this data set and I can use this decision in order to make a prediction for a new data set that it will arrive for which I do not have the label. Question, what allows you to extrapolate? Why it is a reasonable thing to think that you can do this extrapolation? Suggestions? What else can you do? Huh? What else can you do? What else can you do? Yeah, it's the best you can do, that's true. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So what you're saying is if I have an appropriate model for my points, then I can think of, I can think of this as, as a generalization for what is happening for the regions where I do not have points, right? Um, so now comes the hypothesis that we have to understand. So remember that we are, remember that we're talking of supervised learning, right? So we have a training which means that the ground truth exists. So I have some features in, I don't know, the left of the colors, or the left of the sepals or the, the petals of the flowers and the, the class. Nature or God or whatever knows, right? The right answer exists because this is a supervised learning thing. When you do a data modeling, which is we are normally used to do in physics, uh, you, you get the points of your inclined plan and you put in the graph and you do the regression and things like that. What you're trying to do uh, is you're trying to 
describe what happens in the nature box, right? Because when you, when you do a physical model, you are actually trying to understand the physics behind it. So you're actually trying to see, okay, what is the best that I can do? Even if you have only a statistical model, even if you say, okay, uh, this measurement comes from, is a random variable coming from uh, the normal distribution or something like that, what you're trying to do is to uh, describe what happens in the nature box in some very broad and general way, right? So when I, normally when I say this, statistical inclined people get very uh, uneasy because we are not trying to explain, but keep here with me, in the general case, what we are trying to do in a normal physical modeling is trying to understand what happens in the nature box. When I have an algorithm, algorithmic model, which means a machine learning based model, I do not care what happens in the nature box. Right? I do not care. So in this case, if we are in this case, it is easy to understand why I can extrapolate, right? Because I'm trying to model what happens in the nature box. If I know what happens in the nature box, then okay, I can put other things inside and I will, I will understand. When I'm trying to do algorithmic modeling, I do not care what happens in the nature box. The only thing that I'm trying, to, that I'm saying is, I have these uh, features here, and the other side I've had some labels, and I have some relation that I can make between them. So when I do a nearest neighbor a decision tree, any kind of machine learning, it's not trying to do, a, uh, it's not trying to understand the physical modeling behind that. They're just trying to describe relationship between input and output data, right? And, uh, and then how do we phrase in this, in, how do we phrase this in, in a more mathematical way? So uh, what is a, a, our machine learning model? So I have the training, I have the data, which would be the training and the test set of the target set. I have, the, I, I'm calling key here, uh, all possible features that I can measure. So for example, all possible lengths of petal of my, of my, uh, of my flowers or all possible house prices that I can, or, or all possible uh, number of rooms that I can have in my houses in my other example. Uh, and then I will have a learner. A learner is something that learns, is the algorithm we were talking about before. Uh, and a loss function. A loss function is something that tells me if I'm wrong on, and how, how good I am and how bad I am on this. And then in this, in this, uh, in this uh, kind of setup, why should this work? What I'm telling you is that I have a loss function that tells me that this learning model gives me a prediction of each one of these y's, of these labels. Uh, and these labels are reasonably good to estimate the classes for something that was not used in my training, right? Why should this work? Any suggestions? Why should I expect this thing to work? Is, huh? You shouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a very good answer. Uh, well, the point is that you have hypotheses behind this, right? Uh, so what are the hypotheses that are never talked about that are behind this thing? The, the point is that we have a data generation model behind this. So I'm, I'm, I'm having the hypothesis that, that I have um, a probability distribution over all possible features that I have, so over all possible uh, number of rooms or all, all possible size of petals. Um, and, uh, and the actual, the actual things that I have in my data set I, I are only realizations of that, uh, of that distribution. And I have a true labeling function, which I don't know what it is, but as this is a supervised learning model, this, la this true <coughs> labeling function exists, right? And then I have a loss function, which is basically uh, prob the probability that I will take one data from my, from my or one data from one realization from this uh, probability distribution such that my uh, learner will give me a wrong prediction, right? The main thing that we should learn here is that this hypothesis is absurdly data dependent, right? So what I'm telling you, you see that everything that I say here is based on the existence of this probability function. And this probability function is written over all possible samples. It doesn't matter if it's from the training or the target. As a consequence, these things will only work if your training and your target sample comes from the same distribution. 
you should not expect any machine learning model to work if your training and your target set are completely different from each other. They should be, if they come from the same underlying distribution, you have some security that you say, okay, I trained my model here, and even though this is different data set, I can expect it to work. Is that okay? <coughs> Uh, and obviously there are complications. You will never know. Although we are based on P and this true labeling function, we will never know what these things are. So everything we can do is approximate. So uh, the loss function, it will not be the true loss function, but would be the good approximation that you can have, given that you will never have access to P or uh, the true labeling function, right? Um, and then another thing that it's very important to keep in mind is that all of this, all of these items, forms a machine learning model, right? A machine learning algorithm, it's only the learner. And whatever you say, people talking about neural networks or deep learning or random forest or nearest neighbor or whatever, all of these different algorithms, they are only one, one element of a machine learning model. And you have to make sure before you start any machine learning uh, analysis that uh, all of these things uh, uh, are satisfied, that your data satisfies this assumption before you start uh, trying different, different algorithms to see if they feed your data. Is that okay? So let's, uh, let's go through a, little, a, little, uh, a few different uh, learning algorithms that we have here. Uh, so a, a Kenyan's neighbor algorithm is uh, one of the most simple ones. So I have uh, a training data here. Uh, I have a training data which is uh, these yellow things and these uh, uh, purple things. And I have a data set here that I want to know the label. So I, I will make a, a circle around this and say, okay, which are the three nearest neighbors of these guys? So, and then I do a majority vote. So if I say, okay, I have two purple guys and one yellow guy, probably this guy is purple or things like that. Obviously, you have parameters to tune on this, right? You have this, this K can be, uh, this, this, this K is a parameter that you can fix. And also, you can give different weights. You can say, okay, the guys who are close to me are much more important than the guy that are, there is very far away from, even if I try to do this with 10 in their group or something like that. So all of this is parameters you can trust. Uh, this can also be done in a regression example. So in a regression example, I have, um, I have these points, the blue points uh, are uh, my data, and then if I want to estimate something in, in the middle of them, uh, you see that I can uh, take the two closest points and do a mean of them, and then I will have this as an estimation. If I take the three closest points, then I have this as an estimation and things like that. This is not very used, but it's still possible uh, to do in a regression exercise. Uh, support vector machines are, um, are, are very similar to the very simple thing that I was talking about. You are trying to look for uh, uh, hyperplanes in your parameter space. So this is a, a two-dimensional example. So you are going to start uh, to look for uh, planes or lines in this case, which separates your training data the best. Right. So for and and this is going to be weighted by how far away they are from all of your data. So for example, uh, in this case, I would give preference for the A uh, instead of the B because the B gets very close to the uh, to to the actual data points itself. And uh, if you can, this can also be done in higher dimensions. So you see, we have a we have a kernel trick. That allows you, for example, if you have this data, so inside is blue, outside is red, and uh, it's not linearly separate in this dimension. But if I have a, a third dimension here, which is, for example, the distance between the center to the center of the circle, you see that now in this third dimension, I can actually find a hyperplane that actually separates my data very well. Uh, and there's a, some, uh, the kernel trick is some mathematical uh, uh, magic that allows you to do this projection without actually knowing the mapping. So you can do uh, this kind of, of separation very easily and very fast. But it's the same, uh, it's the same idea in, um, in, in higher dimensions. Um, the other, other possibility are uh, decision trees. Uh, so decision trees are, 
things, uh, decision trees, it's very sim This is one, one of the algorithms that work the best uh, because they are, uh, they, they come from, it, they, they try to mimic what happens in the human brain when you take a decision. So uh, in decision trees, what you do is, this is an example for, uh, for classifying uh, galaxies. So you have mag magnitudes here, uh, and then you say, okay, I will take this feature, in this case, a magnitude of a galaxy, and then I will look at my training data because in the training data, I know the labels. So I say, okay, it seems that in the G magnitude, I have a cut in this case, 1.35 or something like that. So you say, okay, if I, uh, this is probably colors, colors, U plus I. Uh, so if you say, okay, and then you separate these guys and then you have, okay, here I have things that are not merging and then here I, I get uh, a group that is still uh, that is still uh, contains a lot of things, and then I have different different features that are go making these decisions one by one. This is a sequential. This is a sequential thing. But in the end, this is the one the simple algorithm that works the best, especially for uh, a high, uh, very complicated classification systems, and because this actually uh, this actually mimics what we think of when we when we try to do this kind of thing. And also, you, this can be as complicated as you want. So, if you have a random forest, uh, random forest uh, examples means that you have in each uh, you have a lot of different uh, decision trees. You start in different different uh, stages, or you start with different features. So, all the, each tree will be different from each other, and in the end, you will have a, a majority voting class. In, in the end, here you will have one vote for the classification of each one of those trees. And this allows you to do one a majority vote, or you can also use this, these votes as a probability for the classification of each one of those classes. So, yeah? To exclude the error out of the assumption of the machine use. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this is used to exclude the error. Are you stating or are you making a question? No, I'm asking. Uh, right. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I, I am not sure if this is used to, to exclude the error. I know that this, uh, so you can think that, okay, I think you can think that trying to dilute the error. Let's, yeah, yeah, let's put it like this, yes. Because if you have only one tree, the point is if you have only one tree, you'll be highly dependent on where you start or which feature you start uh, to begin with. If you have, if you begin with different different stages and different features and you come to the same conclusion, that's probably a more uh, robust result in that sense. So I would say that it dilutes the error for, through the, because you will also have sometimes a very low probability, which means at least one of these trees will give you an answer that's probably not the correct one. But as you have many of them, you can, you can wait that. Uh, and this is used for classification, but you can also use that for regression. Um, so this would be, this, this is less obvious because in a regression exercise you have to beam, right? Because a regression means that your label is a, a float, uh, a real number. Uh, so you have different trees which gives you, you are going to beam uh, in different stages of the tree and this will, are going to give you different answers and in the end you can use the mean or the median as a uh, 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 to, to classify, to characterize your, your results. This is also this is also a lot used in astronomy, especially in uh, photometric redshift estimation. So when you're doing photometric redshifts, uh, each one of your features will be your magnitudes in different bands, and then you can start doing this this tree binding uh, on your results and uh, average the classification. So unsupervised, so I, I gave you an up to here. Up to here, all of the elements that I gave you, we had a training sample, right? So we have a training from which we have the labels and then we were learned from these labels. Um, here, I'm going to, 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 to be now on unsupervised learning. Uh, so unsupervised learning, just to remember, is when you do not have, uh, when you not, do not have any labels and you are looking for uh, structures in your data. Uh, and if I come to my definition of the machine learning model that I was talking before, uh, this is much more complicated because now there is no ground truth, right? This is a mathematical ill pose problem by definition because in unsupervised learning there, are, there is, 
there is not uh, what is the cluster or what is a group or what is a structure that you're looking for. Uh, it's not a, 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 a well-defined subject. So if you if you go back to the elements of what we were talking before, mm -hmm. uh, you would have no labels because there are there is no ground truth. Uh, you have no loss function because you, you 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 don't have anything to compare with. You have no true labeling function, so you will end up with only uh, a few of the elements we had before. Um, what happens here is that the learner, what the learner is trying to do is to characterize the probability over all your data sets. So think of your data set as a multidimensional manifold, right? What unsupervised learning is trying to do is trying to identify heels, uh, tops, uh, heels and, and, and deeps uh, in this manifold uh, of your data. And then how you define how deep you want uh, the uh, to be or how high you want the top to be, it's, it's, it's up to, to, to your decision. Uh, what happens many times when you are doing unsupervised learning is that you, depending on how you define a cluster, depending on how you define a group, you will have a different answer. And that's completely okay within the, within the, uh, within the structure. You just have to understand of what exactly you're looking for. So, for example, suppose that I have this data and I, get, I have a feeling that I have groups in this data. Uh, but I don't know how and I actually don't know, I, I don't know exactly which point belongs to which group. So k-means is a very, a very famous algorithm that uh, you have, the, the, for input for k-means, you have to tell how many groups you have, right? So this is an input for the algorithm. So if you say you have three, group, three groups, the algorithm works like this. First, you assign three random points in your parameter space. In this case, if you see there are three, three points uh, lying here in the beginning of this, um, of this, uh, of this group, which would be three. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you have three points there that are uh, completely random. The second, the second step, you all you attribute each one of these data points to the nearest centroid, right? And then uh, once everyone has its own centroid, uh, you move the centroid to the center of the data points that belongs to it. This is what this this GIF is doing here. So you start, uh, uh, you start with. Uh, a centroid uh, here, and then in the beginning everybody's blue because this guy is closer to everyone. And after a while, you will have uh, other labels, and things are uh, iteratively coming to the end. And when these things converge, which means when the centroid stops moving because you are you are basically on the center of your distribution, you can um, you can think that you reach uh, uh, the configuration, and you can assign the uh, each point to its specific uh, centroid. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Here it's in. He's here. It's input. You have to tell. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is it possible to uh, the algorithm get this from Yes. I, I, yeah. I'm going to talk about uh, not in this algorithm. Okay. This algorithm requires that you that you put the number. But I I'll give you a few examples where you don't need to to to, to put the numbers or. Um, the other thing that is very that has been used in astronomy a little bit more it's self-organizing maps, uh, and in here you don't need to you don't need to to, to, to input the number of groups that you have. Uh, so self-organizing self-organizing maps um, it's something like this. What the, the uh, what the algorithm does is it projects your data. It doesn't matter the dimensionality of your data. It's going to project your data into a two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional grid in such a way that things that are closer together are going to be similar to each other and things that are uh, far away from each other will be different uh, from each other, okay? So uh, bear with me a little bit. So I have my initial grid. You have to decide this, this, uh, this, this, this size of your grid. So here I have a 16 uh, 4 by 4 grid and I populate each one of these cells with a random vector by the size of my data. So if I'm using galaxies, for example, and I have four different, uh, four different magnitudes for my, for my galaxies, each one of these random vectors will be a random vector uh, with four elements, four random numbers. Is that okay, right? Okay, okay. So uh, I have one random vector in each one of these cells, and then I choose one of my data points, right? In any one of my data points. 
And then I will find, uh, obviously all of these are random, but by chance you will have one of these random vectors that are more similar to your actual, actual data set. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that numerically it's closer to your data than all of the other, uh, all the other random vectors. Once you do this, you will substitute the, uh, the vector that was here. It's not a, a complete substitution. It's not that you will take your data and you will put in that cell, but there is a transformation that we will do with that random vector so that that random vector will get very sim more similar to your data point D1 than it was before. And you are also going to do this with this cell and with the other cells, but the neighbors will be a, a slight less modification because it will be closer, but not so much. Uh, and then you do this, uh, you slightly modify the, the vector of the neighbors to resemble, and you do this one by one with each one of the, of the vectors in your data set. So is it, is, is, it, is it clear why in the end these will cluster together things that are similar to each other? If I have a data and then in the end you store the assigned locations, so I will not I will not uh, care about the random vectors, but I will assign different, or I will keep record of, okay, this uh, data number 25 was in this cell and data number one was in this cell. In the end, if you check each one of these data points, you will see that things that are the same cell are very close to each other and say things that are in, like this guy are very different from that guy and very different from that guy. Is it obvious why this diverges? Yes. <laughs> okay. At each point, I am at each point. I am bringing closer. I, I am bringing one data point and making one cell closer to this data. When I come to the second point, the, I will choose the data which the, the random the cell which contains the vector which is close to this random data to the second data. If the second data is very close to the first one, it will fall in the same cell. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so this is an example. Uh, we did this uh, with uh, spectra of type 1 supernovae because we were trying to identify if we can uh, only data-driven find subtypes of type 1 supernovae. So you took a lot of type 1 supernova spectra and I, we played this game that I talked to you about. I don't think you can see, but in the end you have one, two, three, I don't know, a very big grid. Uh, but in the end uh, you have all of these guys like here are 91 BG like guys. You have a peculiar supernova uh, here. Uh, you have 91 T guys uh, up here and all of the guys in the middle are normal. Uh, these are, are normal and these are all high velocity feature objects. So you see that uh, we know this in retrospect, because obviously we are used to, we can look at this data and identify this. But if you have a high, uh, a very high dimensional data set, you can use that uh, to do a similar game. And this has been used also for galaxy classification, for example, morphological classification of galaxies and things like that. Um, the question you can ask is, are these really unsupervised methods? Because, uh, okay, I learned something, right? I uh, I shift my data and I uh, organize my data in such a way that uh, that um, uh, similar things are clustered together and different things are farther apart, but I'm not giving any number of clusters of any number of groups in here. So this is, you can think of this, of, of, we can think of this as a pre-step a pre of the actual definition of groups. And then, as I said before, how you define your groups, it, it, uh, it depends on how you define your distances or what science you are interested in, uh, in doing. Um, and this is where it's very important to understand that uh, even if you do a very complicated machine learning model, in the end, domain knowledge is absurdly important in order to make the decisions uh, that you have to make in order to get the most that you can get out of your machine learning algorithm. Is that fine? Um, so, uh, I have uh, just a summary of what I talked here before. Uh, so, what, do, what I want you to remember from this, if you have to remember only uh, a few things. Uh, remember that the definition is, of learning is different from what we 
or what we know or what we expect the definition of learning for humans. Um, supervised machine learning models means that you have a loss function that you have to minimize. There is no magic. The machine learning model will not find some absurdly interesting idea that you don't, haven't thought about before, right? Uh, all that it's doing is minimizing the loss function. And if you, even if you have a very complicated code, you can go inside there and you will find a, a loss function that it needs to minimize. Unsupervised learning is trying to characterize the distribution of your data. Uh, so it's trying to, to, to find the structure uh, of your data, but there is no ground truth in this sense. And the most important, the machine learning algorithm or the learner is only one element in a large machine learning model. Uh, and you should pay attention to, other, to the other elements uh, of, your, of your learning model as well. Uh, and then just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, uh, so here today, there are what we call generations of machine learning algorithms, right? So uh, the, first, the first generation was, the first one that I talked before, a rule. I put a line here and that's it, right? This is the first generation. If I have a machine that finds that line, I would say, uh, uh, in the beginning, you would say this is the, the first generation of very, very simple code. The second generation was uh, the simple machine learning algorithms that I talked to you about today. Uh, uh, nearest neighbors, random forest, things that uh, rearrange the decisions a little bit, but it's still uh, very, uh, there's not very much complexity on it. The third generation of uh, machine learning models is, is when you start to boost the complexity of those things. So then you start with, uh, uh, with deep learning and, um, and, and higher convolutional neural networks and things like that. And the fourth generation is adaptive learning. Uh, and adaptive learning is when the algorithm is not passive to your data, uh, which means that the algorithm itself tells you this is a good data, this is a bad data, this is a data that I need a label, this is a data that I do not need a label. And so we are going to talk about uh, all those things tomorrow. I hope you, you stop by. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the point here is I have, I have this, this grid that is populated with random data. And what I want is to get close approximations to the data. I do not want to make the cells exactly like my data uh, because then I, I'm going to be losing the randomicity, if that's a word. Uh, but you, you have a certain random, random element in there uh, that you do not want to lose. You want that, uh, that, uh, that the vector that populates that cells uh, gets a little bit closer to your data, but not too much because it's still, you still want to be able to capture uh, other objects that it's not exactly like that, that one, but will be very close to it. Uh, and just a, a one clarification, when I talk about this, um, the, I, I store the, the information of which data set, uh, which data vector I, uh, I assign to itself, but the data vector itself is not, is not stored here, right? The data vector is only used to calculate this transformation in the vector that populates that cells and the, the neighbors that it has. Well, you have here about the spectrum of that it's four, you have um, custodial drops, for instance, uh, the rain drops, mm -hmm. right? And you have uh, some area, right? Mm -hmm. And you start learning each time the drops are close to each other, etc. Mm -hmm. et so, as far as I understand from the result, you must obtain even distribution of drops in each of your cells, right? Uh, yeah, you will have, I will say you will have different groups of types of drops in different regions of the cell. But they should be exactly fit in the, in the, in the limit of the infinite number. Yeah, yeah, in the limit, yeah, 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 in the, 
yeah in in the in the uh, yeah because it, in this in this case in the end of infinite numbers you do not have some fluctuations in your manifold so then yeah, but, but in the beginning you would find some clusters right yes yes and your your statement is that uh, the, this loading algorithm adjusts itself um, each time each yeah, to the data that you have, uh, uh, yeah, and that's very important, that's very important. This is to the data that you have, and uh, all, of, all of the things that I talked before, they will only be as good as your data is. So sometimes, if I'm, I'm finding structures that are not there, for, for example, in your example, if I have just a, a small number of, uh, of data and I find structures that are actually not there, just means that I don't have enough information in order to get the, 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 the actual features that I need. Uh, but that can only be uh, remedy with more data, right? And all, of, all, everything that I talk here are conditional to how good your data is, given the the answer, the question you are trying to answer. And another question is how what are errors in the data? Ah, which you are thinking about. Because yeah, that's some reverse not yeah, that yeah. some error class. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this. This is, this is where I think collaboration with machine learning people are extremely important. Uh, most of the machine learning algorithms have no idea what an error bar is. Uh, so everything I talk to you about here doesn't take into account at all that you have error bars in your measurement. And we know that in science we have uh, uh, error, bar, uh, error bars in your messages. One thing that I will briefly, but uh, I can give you spoilers because I don't know much about this. Uh, I know there are people trying to develop by Asian approach because uh, uh, if you go to, from the statistical perspective, everything that I said here is frequentist, right? Everything that I described here only makes sense in, in the frequentist uh, 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 framework. There are people trying to develop by Asian approaches to machine learning algorithm. In this sense, it would be pretty easy to take into account the error bars because then you can do hierarchical Bayesian models and things like that, and that would be natural. The point is that I, I, I myself don't know at what stage that, that research is. And one of the problems of this is this, with the big data sets, uh, it, it becomes computationally impossible because it's, there's too many, uh, too many data points and uh, it's computationally very expensive. But I have to make my point that I do think that we should go in that direction uh, because I really hope that very soon we will have quantum computers. So it doesn't matter what you have to calculate anymore, you can calculate whatever you want. Uh, so I, I really think that, that that is the way to go because I really think that very soon that will not be a problem anymore. But I don't know what, how to answer your question. Other questions? No? If not, let's thank Sadie again. And uh, see you tomorrow at two in the room number 48.